Hello and welcome to our talk show, Earth Star Talk. Today, I have my first guest here and I'm very excited to talk to Avi Leedsley, Maya of Sacred Winds Healing Services. She is an extraordinary human being with a very intense spiritual background. But before we start the interview, I would like to set an intention with a little prayer process. I ask now the prime creator, source of all light and being to bless these people sitting here in front that only the truth comes forth to the best and highest good for everybody involved and to the best of my capacity and our capacities here as well. All right, wonderful. So thanks for coming. And um, let's talk a little bit about you first. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your connection to the spirit world? Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you for having me here today. Um, I have been uh, engaging in various modalities of healing work for over 30 years. And um, I now just uh, starting to make it more available to uh, people on a, on, on a larger level. And uh, I, my philosophy with Sacred Winds Healing Services is to make my uh, services very user-friendly to, uh, and easy and simple to use without taking away from the effectiveness so that uh, people are more likely to use it. People are less likely to do something that is more ritualistic and lengthy. And my hope is that they can continue to use these tools uh, as we partnership to uh, work on their healing. Wonderful. So um, you have a very extraordinary name. Uh, are you Native American? Um, yes, I am mostly native. Also on my father's side, I mean, I'm sorry, my mother's side, uh, we are Afro-Indigenous. Okay. Um, interesting. So did you grow up in a very uh, ceremonial background? Uh, did your parents or um, some of your ancestors introduce you into their spiritual worldviews? Or did it all come from your inner self? Um, my grandparents, who I, I spent a lot of time growing up in their home, uh, were deeply spiritual. And uh, so that, that had a large influence on me growing up. And uh, so I just continued in those ways and uh, continued to learn from um, a variety of different healing modalities, mm -hmm. teachers uh, that come from many different traditions. Okay. So um, when you connect with spirit, um, how do you connect the spirit? How did you get um, your visions? Because I know we talk privately and uh, we share some of the same visions. Uh, about our planet and that's a part of why I invited you here today so um, how do you connect does it just come to you or do you do a, a ceremony do you do a certain ritual for channeling these information what do you do to get your information from spirit um, as a small child I would pick up information clear audiently and um uh, as I think maybe around 10 years old, I started being able to communicate more with the spirit world. And then um, at age, in my early 30s, I started uh, studying from uh, Thai Buddhist monks. Mm -hmm. I started studying meditation from them and uh, went to live in the temple, in the Thai Buddhist temple for a while and continued to study uh, meditation from them. And uh, in doing so, that helped me to tap into a lot of information, past, present, and future. A lot of, inf a lot of the um, visions that I've had or information that has been conveyed to me regarding things that are happening in the future, um, as well as in the past, has been conveyed to me in dreams as well as in my meditation. Uh, when I go walking in nature, um, I ask for guidance and I ask for clarity to receive that uh, that information because of course if we get guidance and we don't have the clarity to receive that information that's not going to be very helpful right uh so true 
So um, what I'm hearing is that when you walk in nature, you set an intent to receive information. So would you say that your intention to do something is important to receive? Yes. Okay. It's as well as clarity. And um, so meditation is a very, uh, perhaps for me, the most important tool to clear out all the, uh, the chaos and all of the, um, the mental chatter and mm -hmm. uh, emotions that uh, get in the way of us being able to perceive, uh, which create interference such as um, emotions uh, uh, like grasping or fears. Um, those are interference when we're trying to get that, uh, those messages clearly. So would you say that where meditation helps you to kind of like step out of the 3D chaos and go into a little bit more oneness point where we are more in one with the spirit and seeing the bigger picture and therefore are not so tossed and turned in the three dimensional reality with all the dramas? Yes. Okay. So, um, I'm sure that not everybody of our viewers is able to meditate so easily. What tips would you give them to make it a little bit easier to meditate? You mentioned, for example, nature. So just being in nature, can it be like a walking meditation to just walk in nature, pay attention and breathe and uh, just uh, pay attention to the environment? Is that the kind of meditation you do? Or what kind of meditation do you exactly do? How do you start? You know what? Thank you for asking <laughs> And this is a good point because I hear a lot of people say that I can't meditate because I sit down to meditate and it just doesn't happen to me because I have so many thoughts going on, worries, concerns, etc. And so um, there's different types of meditation, even within the Theravada tradition. And by the mm -hmm. way, I've also studied meditation uh, briefly with the Tibetan Buddhist monks as well. Um, and there's many different types of meditation, some that were taught to me by uh, teachers in the physical, some that were taught to me by teachers in the spiritual world. And uh, the different types of meditation um, are for different purposes, which produce different results. Okay. So the Vipassana meditation is an insight meditation. Um, and I do also walking meditation in the Theravada tradition. And I actually like to do the walking meditation first. And so I find that helpful, especially when our minds might be, you know, where we're having a harder time getting grounded or settled in. Mm -hmm. And the other thing too is thought forms have their own energy. Mm -hmm. And so when we sit down to meditate and all of a sudden all these thoughts come to us about, I need to pay this bill. Oh, I need to make a decision about what I'm going to do about this or that. Well, that's right. I forgot to take out some meat for to defrost for dinner or <laughs> whatever it is that, that is filling your head. Um, one of the ways uh, that I was taught to neutralize all of that is to say it's not sure. And uh, by doing that, what that refers to is your brain. And uh, because your brain tends to believe that that's who we are mm -hmm. uh, because your brain is physical but we right. are more than physical. And to then to take a deep breath and clear out that thought. And we're not going to, people expect sometimes for the, the, the whole thought process to stop when you meditate, but that's not what's going to happen. <laughs> that's not possible. And so um, instead just observe the, the thoughts uh, floating by like clouds and then just view them objectively as opposed to getting caught up in them and following them. And, very good stories. I'm glad that you mentioned the brain because um, I love Dr. Jill Balter Taylor. She is a brain scientist, and I love her four characters of the brain: the thinking left brain, the emotional left brain, the uh, emotional right brain, and the thinking right brain. Which, by the way, the right brain is uh, leading us to our uh, infinity and an eternity aspects. Um, so she also says that um, any trigger we have last about 90 seconds biochemically in our body. So every 90 seconds, we can make a different choice. And I think that's pretty fascinating. So when the chatter starts um, in our mind, we can say no. And what I'm doing often is asking this question about like you mentioned the dinner or the bill or 
how is that going to be in the greater scheme of things like five years from today? I had a lot of drama recently with some travels and there was a lot of uh, things that which didn't happen right. And, uh, you know, Sedona was um, close with fire and then now the floods and all this sort of thing. So, and I asked myself, instead of panicking, what do I do? Um, and that has it any relevance in five years from today? And I oftentimes say, no, it doesn't. So why bother about it right now? It's not that traumatic. If it's not that traumatic in five years. So, I mean, which dinner or other things might not be as you know, important in five years either. So maybe that's another hint we can do to say, no, 90 seconds are over, deep breather. And now we're focusing back at hand on oneness and our eternity aspect and shift into the right brain um, energy and shift in our infinity aspect. Um, okay, so that was very helpful about the meditation. And you were also saying something about grounding. Let me say, I find it very important because a lot of people are up here just in their mind, in their thinking mind, and to be grounded, to, to really tune into Mother Earth, embodying being here, even though we are with the awareness spirit, uh, eternal spirit in a human body, but we are having a body and we should pay attention to our body and being grounded with our feet on the earth, no rubber or any material between us and the earth to really feel mother earth's pulse and be grounded by it. Um, so how do you ground yourself? Um, and this is another good question and I'm glad you're asking that because this is uh, going to become increasingly important as we move forward. Uh, there is great power in connecting with the Mother Earth, uh, not only for grounding, but for healing and for messages. And so just like we open ourselves up to listening, when we meditate, uh, we want to create this um, ongoing bond with Mother Earth to provide us with important messages that we will need as we move forward. And, um, and the more you listen, the more you hear. Um, I personally uh, like to sit on the floor a lot, uh, cross-legged, and in that way connect with the Mother Earth. There's times when maybe my energy level is low or I'm not feeling well, I will lay down um, on the Mother Earth and ask for healing, uh, ask for energy or whatever I need. Uh, but yes, it's important to connect with Mother Earth. If you go to sacred uh, sites such as the vortexes in Sedona, if you can take off your shoes and just allow that energy to run up your feet. But we really need to uh, have a give and take relationship with Mother Earth on many different levels. And uh, that's going to be increasingly important as we move forward. Okay, two things. Um, I got chills when you were talking about messages. So we have to talk about messages. Spirit wants us to talk about the messages of the upcoming times. But before we do that, you mentioned the vortexes in Sedona, and not everybody can come to Sedona to find vortexes and be here, especially if there are travel restrictions. So um, in that regard, I tell my clients, it would be good to find a ley line close to you where you're living and the crisscrossing of ley lines oftentimes is like it creates like a mini vortex how do we find ley lines or energy lines of mother earth by looking at the trees and if a tree has two trunks the energy goes right between the two trunks here and that's where um there's so much energy so that the trees have to build out two trunks so when you have one, you will have another and another and another, and that will denote a ley line. And when they're crossing, that's oftentimes energy intense. So um, it is always good to meditate by the trees who are on ley lines because that helps you like um, intense antennas to connect even better. But let's talk a little bit about the upcoming times because again, I'm getting chills here. Spirit wants us to talk about this. Um, and what information are you willing to share? I know you get information uh, about the future, which are not very easy to digest. Um, me the same way. So maybe we can um, talk about 
some signals to be mindful of for our future when we see this, be careful about that, or whatever comes to mind. Um, so what would you say do we not um, have to look forward to or have to pay attention to or have to be cautious about? Um, this is a time that the Mayas refer to as the age of Itza. Itza means water. Water often implies purification. We are in a time of purification that is necessary for our spiritual evolution. And it's important to remember that um, first and foremost, we are spiritual beings with a physical body, not the other way around. And um, we are going through this time, and it is, it is an incredibly uh, powerful honor and a beautiful time to be alive. It is really an honor to be alive right now. Although it is not an easy time to be alive, um, I kind of view it as uh, when a woman is in labor, and you know, initially the the pains will be five minutes apart, and um, at that point in time, maybe you can still joke around <laughs> between those pains. But then, as the pains get closer together, and as they get stronger, uh, things get a little bit more intense. So our response needs to be for us to connect spiritually uh, with the mother earth, with the four elements, with our spiritual guides and teachers, uh, with the light even more intensely as, uh, as we move into that sacredness of uh, that intense pain. That is where we go and sit for refuge. And uh, then, you know, as the pains become closer and closer, eventually it's now it's time to push out the baby and the pains are really consistent and intense and uh, unbearable. And then at that point in time, shortly after that, we have this beautiful new life. And, it, and, in, and once we see this beautiful new life, it is all well worth it. It was all well worth all the pain that we went through. Well, this is, this is the analogy that I use because as we move forward, uh, we are going to experience more pain individually and collectively. And so um, how we react to all of this and our response to all of this and our mindset to all of this um, is extremely important to be attentive to and to, uh, to take care of. We need to be, now more than ever, we need to be flexible thinkers. Uh, we will cause suffering to ourselves and others if we are more rigid. So we need to be flexible thinkers. We need to be, uh, working toward being more cooperative and collaborative, um, more deeply compassionate, patient and empathetic. Uh, there, there's rewards for us individually in, in developing compassion and empathy. We will have more peace. And not only within ourselves, but within, the, within humanity. Um, these are the things that we need to be working on as we move forward. I love that comment, um, this of empathy, feeling and tuning into not just ourselves, which we often uh, not even do, but also into the others. What does the other person feel? What is the other person might think and develop this empathic aspect in our being? Uh, beautifully said. And I love this analogy about the bursting and the bursting pain because um, I can see that happening. Definitely, my guiding ones say that um, between 20, 2020 and 2030, it's like a full moon cycle, you know, also like the bursting, and that we all have to look at our undigested fears and emotions and uh, to tackle the, you know, beast of our fears by the whole, um, by the horns and jump over it to um, learn about self responsibility. Um, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, but also uh, awareness about others and aspect of water, our moon element, our um, feminine side, the right brain side in our uh, being beautifully. So what would you say um, practically, um, what would be your message for the viewers besides this empath, develop this empathic self um, as development in their spiritual self and spiritual side. What else would you like to uh, put to the heart of the viewer 
to do or not to do? Uh, one of the things that I would like to really uh, invite people to do is to be more conscientious about the environment, mm -hmm. uh, take care of the environment, support those who take care, who are taking care of the environment. Uh, really check in with ourselves regularly in terms of where are we creating imbalances within ourselves, within our relationships, within the planet. And uh, if we are uh, putting ourselves in a predicament where we are giving too much, maybe step back. If we are in a position where we're not giving enough, uh, that's something that we can work on. If there's things we need to do, if we need to apologize, if we need to be more patient, let's, we need to work on refining ourselves. And the more we can do that right now, um, the more the purification will be easier for us. Uh, it's like a, those television commercials, act now and avoid the rush. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to tell you just what you were talking about. I got chills again, my hair uh, on my arms are still standing up. So all these are seemingly so tiny little things have a great impact. Um, Spirit wants to emphasize this. So um, thank you, that is great. And I know um, that you're doing healing work. So I saw on your website, um, which is sacredwindsealingservices.com and I will have a link to that um, underneath this video if you want to book with Ahwe Itzli, um, that you can do that. And I saw that you do a lot of ancestral healing. And I find it's very interesting because um, when we think about family constellations, you know, when something is not spoken about or ignored, it will create drama in the family lineage and uh, can help some generations. And then all of a sudden we are confronted with a dilemma, which originally had nothing to do with us as we are signing up for, when we sign up for this reality into this life for seven generations of family beliefs and disbeliefs. So how do you work with your clients when you do ancestral work? Um, there's one of the things that I work on uh, in terms of forgiveness, helping our, uh, let's say, for example, if we have earthbound spirits in our ancestry, helping them to go into the light. And this is also, you know, this is done very gently and lovingly and compassionately. So it's never about forcing anyone, but it's become very much of a popular practice, which I'm grateful and glad about. It's very needed. People need to be calling on their ancestors but you don't wanna call on your ancestors until there's been some clearing, until they're in a good place. Uh, otherwise you can uh, open up some unfortunate uh, energies for yourself. Um, so that, that's really important um, in, in terms of uh, forgiving ourselves is very important. Uh, not only forgiving ourselves in this lifetime for whatever we've done, but in previous lifetimes and forgiving others and uh, and then sometimes we need help with that. Sometimes it's, you know, it's not so easy to uh, forgive others. Um, and so we, it's okay, we can ask for help with that. Uh, ask that for help for others to forgive us, ask for uh, help for us to forgive other people, ask for help uh, to forgive ourselves. And this, this will lighten up the load on mother earth. This will lighten, lighten up the collective karma of humanity. Um, so how do you do that? Are you uh, calling in the person you want to forgive? Or if you have images of past lives, are you calling in that image and ask, you know, I forgive you, I forgive myself, I forgive us both? Do you do it in your mind's eye? Or how do you do it exactly? This is another good question. <laughs> Thank you. Because some people at first, they might think, well, I don't know about this calling of calling on a spirit. That sounds kind of creepy. <laughs> You know, I don't want to know if I want spirits in my house, um, but what you do is you're not actually calling on them to come to be present in your environment. What you're asking is that wherever they're at, that they be forgiven for everything and anything that they've ever done, be relieved of all their suffering and be lifted up um, so that it's not necessary to call them into your space. Now, once you have done that, 
and you want to develop a relationship with your ancestors, that's very powerful. And again, like any other kind of relationship, you want it to be a give and take situation. So um, praying for your ancestors or whatever you do to, uh, to give to your ancestors on an energetic and or spiritual level, um, as well as asking them, please look out, um, please protect me as I make what, my way to work and on my way home again, or wherever you are uh, attempting to go, um, or please help me with this particular situation or this difficult person or whatever it may be. Um, so you can ask your ancestors for help and for guidance. Um, three things that are important to ask for is strength, knowledge, and wisdom. Um, but simultaneously, uh, you want to give to them. Just like any other relationship, it, it needs to be uh, a balance. Okay, so how do you give to your ancestors? I know that in uh, several... Uh, cultures they bring even food like in yep, yes. Japan they bring food they bring uh, fragrances um, you know incenses burning yes. and in others they bring food on a mound or bring it to the grave side or even digging up their ancestors and sit them uh, on a chair in some cultures I've seen that very different than here in the western world so um, what would you recommend for the viewer how to thank the ancestors just mentally saying thank you all my relations, all my uh, ancestors who walked the earth before me who were part of my DNA structure or how do you do it? Um, first of all, I want to be very respectful to people that come from uh, many different traditions, spiritual traditions, as well as people that may be agnostic or atheists. And so I try to um, speak to everyone in their own language in terms of their beliefs, their perspectives, their traditions. And uh, so for people that are more agnostic or atheists, you know, I try to use more of the, uh, the scientific approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, it's true. And it's very powerful to do food offerings. Um, I do food offerings. Um, and of course, if people say, well, why do a food offering? They can't eat it. It nurtures their spirit. It helps them on their journey. Um, if they are in transition, if they just passed for the 49 days following their passing, uh, if you can do that, especially on the day that is like uh, every seven days on the anniversary of the day that they passed, that will also help them uh, to, to have a good transition in, into the next life. Um, so food offerings, yes, if you pray, uh, do create a visualization, anything like that. Uh, that will also help them. Uh, you know, you can pray for them if you pray. Um, yeah, so, and, and again, as I mentioned, the food offerings. Um, so there's many different ways to give to your ancestors. Okay. Um, interesting that you mentioned the days after their um, crossing over. As you know, I'm a medium and uh, people come to me to connect with their ancestors. And um, I noted one thing, and I just want to put that out here, that when a person is crossed um, over, they're not always totally disappearing from this reality right away. I have noticed that uh, spirits stay to say their goodbye up to about a week after their passing. So oftentimes they visit people and relatives in their dreams to say their goodbyes, or even more physical if they can do so and materialize themselves in their, in their old uh, stomping grounds or houses or wherever they are without being earthbound. And then about a week after the funeral, um, there is more connections as well. And then all of a sudden it stops. So like if I found it interesting that you were saying the seven day cycle, because I noticed that uh, as well, that after seven days, for example, after the funeral, all of a sudden there's nothing because the spirit has to focus back to their home to make aware that they are no eternal soul rather than a physical body with a physical identity in 3D, three dimension. So um, interesting observation that you have knowledge about the seven day cycle as well. Okay, so um, any particular messages for the viewer? We talked about forgiveness already. That's great to make our load lighter and everybody else's load lighter too. Makes a lot of sense to me. I hope it makes a lot of sense to you, yours as well. 
Um, any other practical advice you might have for uh, our viewers to take something uh, with them from our talk today, which they can practice on a daily basis or at least the one or other time to connect to their spirituality and, and, and take that over into their daily lives? Uh, yes, I, I remember one time when uh, I think it was about 25 years ago and I was working on a project uh, with Earthbound Spirits <laughs> and I went to the elder monk and I said, Lumpa, and I explained to him what was happening, which was terrifying me. <laughs> and uh, he said, don't be afraid of your projects. This was uh, Lumpa, uh, Lumpa Suntoin from uh, the Santa Rosa Temple. Thai Buddhist temple at the time. I don't be afraid of your projects. And I was like, but Lumpur, I was hoping this could be more like our project, more like your project. <laughs> and the advice that he gave me when I was in this place of, uh, I, I was experiencing a lot of fear. He didn't tell me, don't be afraid, or there's nothing to be afraid of, or there's no reason to be afraid. Because none of that ever helps, right? <laughs> right. What he said was like one of the most powerful tools that uh, anyone ever gave me. And what he said is, let your compassion be greater than your fear. And so uh, if I sometimes go to bless a house or anything like that, people say, wow, you can do this and you don't get afraid. I would get afraid and uh, <laughs> you're very brave. And I tell them, it's not that I don't ever get afraid. <laughs> it's just that I remember long book. Uh, Lumpur's words to me about that your compassion be greater than your fear because those in the spirit world are suffering. If we see human beings suffering, we want to help them. These are also human beings just without a body. And so uh, to allow it, our, our compassion and our love to be much stronger than any kind of fear. And if, if we can just not just fill ourselves up with love, but be love, like truly just be at the embodiment of love, then we are, there's not going to be any more space for fear. And that's the space that we need to sit in. That is where we sit in the eye of the storm. One of the analogies that I use is, um, it's like going through a cave and the cave is dark. And we've traveled for a while through that cave who we're getting weary and tired. And we're starting to feel sometimes like losing hope. Uh, and every now and then we catch a glimpse of, at, of the light at the end of the tunnel. So even in moments where uh, the pathways in the, in the cave curve and uh, maybe we have to climb more and things are, uh, have, there's more obstacles in our way uh, and it's more treacherous. Even in those moments where there's a curve in, in the pathway um, and we cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. We know the light of the at, at the end of the tunnel is there. And that is what we need to stay focused on. Wonderful. Um, and I think uh, it's interesting that you talked about clearing and blessing houses because I come from a background where I do a lot of, uh, not ghost busting, uh, that's an ugly word maybe, but clearing <laughs> houses and uh, uh, clearing demons out of houses. I've been featured in several uh, TV shows, uh, a haunting twice and then another haunting in the heartland. And uh, it can be really a little bit scary when we um, you know, encounter a demon. And what I was told by my spirit guides is that if you develop, like you said, love, you become so strong that um, you become like a fountain of light. And have you ever uh, felt a resistance when you put the thumb on a fountain? There's resistance of the water spouting up. So when you become a fountain of light by being love and practicing love and practicing, I love life and life loves me back, then this energy becomes strong in you like a balloon and anything dark and negative cannot really approach you anymore. And that's exactly how I do the work with the house clearings too. I come in and people like to you said, oh, you're not afraid of it. And I said, well, not really. I mean, there are some sketchy moments, but not really because I can trust the light in me. 
And may I share one little story of my own self, please? Um, interestingly enough, when I was at the Hopi Mesas, um, something followed me home, which was a very intense spirit and very dark, not really friendly, because um, it had something to do with crystal scars. But that's another story. So it challenged me and uh, I asked my guides, what do I do? What do I do? And um, my guiding one said, well, we will take care of it, but tomorrow it will come back and then you will have to deal with it. So um, it came back and it challenged me again. And I said, well, um, you have no right to interfere in my life. You have no right to interfere in my free will. I said it three times. And if you do not uh, let go, then you will be dispersed. And so it tried to enter me and I let it, please, for the viewers, do not do that. Do not let uh, uncontrolled spirits enter your body if you do not have the help of your spirit guides really, really strongly. And then um, they were telling me, my guiding one, so, okay, now, uh, it, and by the way, it felt like uh, hell was freezing over. It was ice cold in my body. It was really, really, really cold. And they said, envision your soul frequency, your soul light, the golden light, flow from the top through your body and envision that uh, entity with love that is part of God's creation and had its purpose for whatever reason. Uh, but now it is time to go and be involved in love. And so I embraced it with love and it dispersed in a million shards from the darkness it was, it became light. And they said, see, on also the darkest darkness darkness is condensed light in effect and that gave me a big learning lesson at the time because i realized what we say in the blame shame game oh this is good this is bad this is dark this is light this is this this is that which is part of duality um there is something bigger behind that concept of duality and that's oneness and in the oneness there is light so thank you for this comment about the love i hope we can all be more in our heart and being heart centered and being in our love, that was very good practical advice and every step, every tiny step counts. So um, I shared a little extraordinary experience uh, with the viewers with my encounter with a demonic entity. Do you have any particular extraordinary experience or spiritual experience you would like to share, which our viewer might say, oh, wow, if she can do it, I can do it. Um, well, first of all, one thing that I would like to recommend is something that was shared with me uh, many years ago uh, by my spiritual teachers uh, from many di different traditions. And that is that there are projects out there that are uh, way out of our league, uh, regardless of who you are. Um, and I, I would like to add that to my disclaimer, I cannot walk on water. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we have to be very humble and, and uh, acknowledge what uh, some, we have to always check before I work on a project, is this out of my league or is this something I'm supposed to do? Um, and we want to make sure we're not coming from a place of ego. And we want to make sure that we're coming from a place of love. And uh, I don't go out looking for situations to then, uh, you know, be the rescuer or save or to, to uh, soothe my ego. Um, if I encounter something and there's no way to evade or walk away from it, um, then I will work with it. But in everything that I do, um, I am not forcing or pushing or pulling. Um, I'm trying to be as loving as I can. And sometimes it requires a great deal of patience and time uh, sometimes they linger on just a little bit longer than you would like for them to. But in that process, their energy gets lighter and lighter and lighter. And um, yeah, a lot of people have the perspective that earthbound spirits are evil people. And that's not necessarily true. It, it could happen for a variety of different reasons. And so, um, again, being compassionate, being patient, but uh, not... Uh, going out of our way to look for these situations. Yeah. Okay. So um, one last question. What is your most 
favorite thing you do in your work? Um, if clients should come to you and work with you, what do you love to do most from all you do? Yeah, where you would say, I love to work with clients who are open to change, who are, you know, what area of your work do you love the most? Um, I practice different modalities from different traditions, such as mm -hmm. like trauma release exercises and EFT. I do EFT different than everybody else. Okay. Um, but uh, so I enjoy doing that. But also, I because for me, when I do the healing work, it's not about me and what I would like. <laughs> for me, it's more about uh, what is it that that person needs to uh, move into a place where they can develop, recognize, and refine their own medicine and come into their own power uh, to be able to develop on their spiritual path to do what it is that they need to do. How best can I support them? And that might look like a variety of different ways. And so then watching them come into their own, uh, not giving away their power anymore, uh, connecting with their purpose and healing, um, I share that joy with them, um, and how in and how I support them, and what modalities I use may look totally different for each person. Wonderful. So, any last things we haven't mentioned, and uh, you would like to share before we close? I have the feeling that this was not our last interview. I think there. Are some more to come down the road, but anything you would like to share, um, which we haven't mentioned yet? Uh, yes. Um, one thing that I would like to share, and this is something that I started talking about years ago, is that I think maybe 30 years ago, I started talking about this, is that we're moving, going to be moving into a time where more and more the truth is going to be revealed. And we're already seeing some of that on many different levels and uh, you know, individually and collectively in many different areas of our lives uh, on the planet, uh, historically and otherwise. And um, if we are to evolve, uh, if we choose that path, uh, we have to open ourselves up to truth. And if we align ourselves with truth, we'll be able to fulfill what it is in uh, that we are required to do in terms of our purpose here on earth. Um, if we resist, we will experience constriction. And this constriction will make us increasingly uncomfortable. If we uh, move into a place of truth, we'll experience expansion and peace. And Truth is not always fun and easy. Sometimes there's uncomfortable truths uh, about ourselves, about our relationships, about our past, um, about our families, about our communities, about the planet, uh, about the future of humanity. Uh, however, the more that we can sit in that place of truth and embrace the truth that, uh, that there is, uh, you know, in a lot of cultures, the uh, truth is synonymous with, uh, with God. Um, so embracing that truth humbly with an open heart and an open mind is how we need to move forward, uh, even when the truth is uncomfortable. And as I mentioned earlier, sitting in that place of humility, if there's uh, it, becoming better listeners, uh, it, it requires humility to sit in a place of humility. Uh, I'm sorry, it requires humility to sit in a place of truth. Uh, because, as I mentioned, the truth is not always comfortable. But we, ha again, have to be flexible thinkers as we move forward. Because Mother Earth is doing this shifting, whether we like it or not, whether we're ready or not. These changes are going to happen. And so we have to really learn how to go with the flow. Well, thank you so much for these wonderful words. It was delightful to talk to you. And I think maybe another time we talk more about specifics about what's coming down uh, onto us or um, 
to shift uh, ourselves from 3D to four dimension or shift Mother Earth into more freedom of her body and um, renew ourselves, like you said, in a birthing. Um, thank you so much, Ahwe Leedsley, for being here today. I loved our interview. I hope the viewers do it too. And um, on the bottom, there will be a link to sacredwindshealingservices.com and you can book a session if you so desire. For now, I thank you very much and I um, wish you all the best. Thank you for coming. And thank you for having me, Claudia. It was delightful. Yes. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.